So we continue from the uh, story of the Akedah to the, the Midrashim that we have here about Itzhak and Sarah and Rivka. So the Torah says, Vayvi'eha Itzhak ha'ohela Sarah imo, that Itzhak brought Rivka to his mother's tent. So the Midrash says, If all the days that Sarah was alive, it was a man connected to the path of Ahola, or to the path of the path, or to the path of the path of Isa, and to the look from the day of Shabbat and to the day of Shabbat. So they said that when Sarah was alive, the, there was a cloud that symbolized the divine providence, and that cloud was hovering over the tent, and their doors were wide open, so obviously it's a tent, so that means that there's hospitality, but the door has a way to, to close the, uh, the front uh, curtain, sort of. Um, that there was barakha ba'isa, the, the dough was blessed. The, the dough of making bread or everything, there was a blessing in it. And that the, the candle was lit from Lel Shabbat to Lel Shabbat. And, but all these things, when, when she died, they all disappeared. But when, when Rivka came into the tent, they all came back. So Rivka now has the same holy status as, uh, as Sarah. So when we look at this Midrash, we want to ask, if, if we take it literally, this is of course not a literal Midrash. It didn't happen that way. It's a, it's a symbolic Midrash. And it speaks about what is the, uh, what is the image or the, what is the, the character of, the, of, uh, of, of a Jewish home. So Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Ahman, in his introduction to Sefer Shemot, he says that everything that happened to Bnei Israel in Mitzrayim from the exile till the exodus is a replay of what happened to their forefathers. He calls it Ma'ase Avot Siman Lebanim. The deeds of the parents set the stage for what the children will do. So he says, Abraham went to Egypt because of the famine and Pharaoh, Pharaoh took his wife. Pharaoh was punished and eventually Abraham left with great possessions. Similarly, Bnei Israel came to Mitzrayim because of the famine. They were tortured by the Egyptians. They took their possessions. Some say their wives also. Then the Egyptians were punished, and then they left with great possessions. Uh, another similarity that uh, Ramban says, says that the exodus was not complete, was incomplete. It's not only getting out of Egypt and, and smiting the Egyptians and all that. He says only when they built the Mishkan, and then he says, the Az. Shavu lemaalat avotehem shehaya sod eloha alei aholehem. So it says only when they built the Mishkan they went back to the uh, to the level to the high level of their forefathers who had the divine providence hovering over their tent. So obviously he's he's alluding to this midrash. What Ramban says is fascinating. Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman. He doesn't say that the Mikdash or the Mishkan, the tabernacle or the temple, that this is the focal point of our Jewish life. But rather, the home is our focal point. The most important place in our Jewish life is the house. And the Mishkan is only a replica of the house. Right? Because he says, when they built the Mishkan, then they became like their forefathers who had the Shekhinah, the Divine Providence, in their tent. So the ideal way is to bring the Shekhinah into your house. So that's the fun, one thing that we have to, to have in mind as we approach the Midrash. That's the symbolism of the Midrash is really about how do you bring spirituality into the home. You know, as you could say also, a lot of, of synagogues and rabbis you know, struggle with the question of how do we bring more people to the synagogue? But I think that's not the right question. The question is, how do you bring more of the synagogue into the house? So people could come and go, but the question is if they take something with them or if they infuse their home with spirituality. And this is what the Midrash is really about. Because if we take the Midrash literally, 
במדרש עז, כל ימים שהייתה שרה קיימת, היה נר דלוק מלילי שבת עד לילי שבת, וכיוון שמתה פסק אותו הנר. There was a candle lit from one Friday to the next, but when she died, the candle stopped. What do you mean the candle stopped? Can't Abraham go and light the candle? Do they mean that there was a special miracle that Abraham would, that Sarah would light it Friday and it would, would, would burn all the way to the next Friday? But Abraham lit it on Friday and it, and it died during the week. Is this the, the meaning of that? Abraham could have rekindled the, the candle during the week. Also, uh, then we say, The tent was open. So when Abraham closed the tent, what is the meaning of all that? So the answer is, like I said, that it's about bringing spirituality into the home. And how do you bring that? There are two, there are two ways that... Uh, we manage or that we build our spirituality towards ourselves and towards, towards others. So, of course, we have to have the connection with God. But the connection with, with, with the Kadosh Baruch Hu, with God, doesn't come if we don't have a connection, a deep connection with ourselves, with our own soul, with our own neshama and spirituality, and with others. So, I'll start from the last one that is mentioned here. Ner daluk minilei Shabbat v'adilei Shabbat. The candle was lit. What does it mean? It means that Sarah had the wisdom and the ability to extend the light of Shabbat so it will impact the whole week. It's not like, okay, six days of work, one unit, Shabbat, a separate unit. No. Shabbat is the day that gives energy for the whole week. You still go... Like some, some of the Hachamim said, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, which in Hebrew is the Rishon, Shani, Shishi. Really, we count all the days in reference to Shabbat. The only uh, you know, other you know, European language that we know that does that is, uh, is Portuguese. It says, you know, Segunda uh, Feria, Tercha Fest, etc. But we, we count, uh, maybe under influence of the Anusim, but we count Rishon, Shani, Shishi, meaning it's the first, second, third. So some commentators said that Sunday, Monday, Tuesday still have the energy from the previous Shabbat, and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is a preparation for the next Shabbat. So sort of like they put the uh, Shabbat in the center of the week. But everything revolves around Shabbat. And, and uh, that was the, uh, the ability of Sarah to do, to create this atmosphere at home that you have this Uh, yearn, yearning for Shabbat. Of course, at the time of Sarah, they didn't keep Shabbat yet. They didn't light candles yet. But the idea is that this is what uh, a woman, as an educator, as a mother, could bring into the house to, uh, to give the children, to give in the, in the house this atmosphere. So you take the light of Shabbat and you extend it for the whole week. So that was the, that was the one blessing. And that is really connecting to our own spirituality. Because on Shabbat we get this We get a certain uh, you know, energy, we recharge our batteries. So if we could make, live on that uh, charge for the rest of the week, then we have that uh, connection to our spirituality. Then we have this interesting concept. The dough itself was blessed, or the bread was blessed. Now what does it mean that it was blessed? That is mevorach. So in, in the language of Hachamim, based on, in the Midrash, but they, they based it on the Torah, the bracha, when you say bracha regarding food, it doesn't mean great quantities. It means satisfaction. So, for example, the bread that is equivalent to this bread, according to Ramban, is the bread that was uh, put in the, in the Mishkan called Lechem Apanim. So in the Mishkan, every week, they would bake 12 loaves of bread and put it there. And then in the following week, they remove the old bread and they put fresh loaves. What do you do with the old loaves? And which, by the way, would remain fresh, according to the Mishnah. Um, today you toast. Yeah. Today you could toast it. No, but the, the reason they remain fresh is because it was matzah. It was not hametz, so it doesn't, it doesn't go bad. It doesn't uh, become moldy after a week. We know somebody eat matzah until the next year. 
So people would eat it. The next, what, what do you do with the, with the old loaves? They would give it to all the Kohanim. You have hundreds of Kohanim. Sometimes thousands. But let's say we'll stick, it, we'll stick to the hundreds. So we see what happens with the, you know, when we do the sh- Kiddush here in the Bet Knesset on Shabbat. I barely have time to cut the halal to halot. It's gone. Right? How do you, with, with about 50 or, or 70 people, how do you give the 12 loaves to hundreds of people and there's room for everyone? So the Mishnah speaks about that. It's, they said that the Kwanim would talk and one of them said, Kezait. I got like the size of an olive. The other one says, Igyani Keful. I got the, the size of a, of a fava bean. And with all that, it was satisfying. That's the cause of bracha. You eat a little bit, and you feel, you feel uh, satisfied. Now, this kind of bracha could, be, could happen in one of two ways. One way, it's a miracle. Right? That the, the little quantity of bread is enough. But the other, the other possibility, which we, have, we can do it today, is it's all about the attitude of the Baal Abayt, right? The hospitality. The um, in Kohelet, no, in Mishlei, we read this pasuk: Tov aruhat yarak veshalom ba mishor avus verivu. Says it's better to have just some vegetables when you eat it with peace of mind than having shor avus a uh, a fat ox, but there's contention, there's there's uh, anger around. So the same thing happens when, when you're uh, a guest some, somewhere and they say, Tfaddal, you know, eat. Sometimes you will be a guest and there's, you know, the meager food on the table, but the, the atmosphere is so welcoming, but you feel so good that you walk out of there, you feel like you ate uh, a whole meal. But then as soon as you go to a place where then there's a lot of food on the table, but people look at you and like how much you eat how this, or they, people say how expensive the food is, you know, how difficult life is. You don't feel like, the, even if you, even you ate, uh, you eat a lot, but you still not, you feel there's not, there's no blessing there, you know? Like they say, in Israel, there is this joke when the Baal Abayt says, you know, go ahead, take another, uh, let's say, take another meatball. And the, and the guy says, no, I already had three. And the Baal Abayt says, you had four, but who's counting? Right, so <laughs> then you know you don't you don't want to eat there. So there's the idea of bracha ba'isa is that Sarah. And that's after Sarah died. I assume that what was not Abraham who was making the bread probably had the maids who, who did that. So they could have made the same bread as Sarah did, but when the table was set, people didn't feel the same atmosphere as it as was there. When Sarah was there, and this is something that really it's it's we have to work on it. We have, Baruch Hashem, you know, we, there's a this is a, what is called in in Arabic hiba, right? The hiba, uh, the hiba, and in, 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 in Arabic too. No, in your Arabic, in Mughrabi, in the Moroccan Arabic, no. hiba. The, the Iraqis don't have it, unfortunately. They don't have it. We don't. They don't have hiba. <laughs> we don't have it. Ma'andum sliba. Ma'andum sliba. Right. Um, <laughs> So, but those two things, now we understand why, this, why the Midrash says there was Anan hovering over the tent. It means that once you have this ability to take the, the beauty and the, the, and the sanctity and the spirituality of Shabbat and extend it for the whole week, and you have also the ability to take your blessing and share it with others, with hospitality, with, with a smile, welcoming them, making them feel good, then... God says, okay, I'll come visit your house. I'll be the Anan, I'll be this divine providence that hovers over the tent. So that's what the Ramban says. The Beta Mikdash imitates the house, emulates the house. So, and now we have to remember that this is how we have to behave at home and do the same thing in the Bet Knesset. So when people come in, they have to be welcome. When we have, we have a Kiddush and someone comes from the outside, Tfaddal, you know, be our guest, make people feel comfortable. But not only in terms of food and hospitality, also paying attention to people's needs. What is it they need? What is that they're missing? You know, if someone comes in and he looks a little lost, okay, we come to him gently, not in a, in a, in a uh, offensive way. Can we help? 
you need the sidu, you need that. Sometimes you'll find out a person came to say Kaddish, he doesn't know, you know how to say it, where to say it. Uh, so this is an important thing, an important message that we see in the Midrash beyond the literal uh, meaning of just what Sarah did at home and what Yifka did at home. We'll stop here, Baruch Adonai.